sticking yourself into camps like Bobites and Benites is a stupid way of thinking about what it means to be Christian. Perfect. It is about having convictions. I do have a conviction that in the sacrament, the real presence of Christ is there. But I wouldn't reject my brother who just sees it as a symbol. It's not that I think that he's right. It's just that I think unity is more important than telling him he's wrong, especially publicly as so many of you sectarianists are in the habit of doing. So my next talk is talking about, and I'm talking directly to, the sectarianists and those that rip apart the body of Christ. Those that divide the body of Christ and separate Christians into denominations. I want to talk to you guys, people who are quick to try and divide us as a church into groups and into parties. And I want to start off by just trying to highlight to you how as an ecumenical Christian I navigate the differences between Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, Copts, and all the different kinds of Christians that there are. The way that I navigate it, and I offer it to you as a means by which you can find the unity in the church, rather than seeking always to find the divisions within the church. A basic paradigm, a basic series of categories that you can think about differences with intelligibly. The first one is to divide doctrine into um, primary doctrine, secondary doctrine, tertiary doctrine, and quarterly doctrine in terms of their relative importance. So primary doctrine are those things that describe who God is or describe what God has done. They're not talking about how God has done something. So all those parts of scripture, all those doctrines of Christians that are talking about who God is or about what God has done are primary doctrines. Our identity as Christians rests upon this matter, rests upon this topic. Our secondary, uh, secondary doctrine are doctrines talking about other matters. Now, from this point on, we Christians can dispute about what's secondary, what's tertiary, what's quarterly in importance. I'm going to offer you what I think is, but I'm open to disagreement. And that which is secondary doctrine is talking about how God did a thing. So not what God did or not who God is, but how God did something. So how God did something is things like creation. Let's talk about creation. What did God do? He created all things visible and invisible. How did God do that? Through processes that we can understand through scientific inquiry or through something akin to a click of the fingers and thus it appeared. Now Christians can disagree about the how. What we can't disagree is about the what and what we can't disagree is about the who. Another example of things uh, that I would say are secondary are things like the punishment in hell. What we can't disagree about is what God has done. He has created a place of punishment called hell. What we can't disagree about is that there is a judgment. But how is the punishment carried out? How, how is that burning up eternal? Are they burnt up and disappear? Or are, are they there constantly, constantly burning? The how is something that we can dispute. The what and the who is something that is indisputable. Things that are, I would say, tertiary doctrines are things like, how do we understand the sacraments? How do we understand the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Is there a real presence in the bread and the wine? Or is it just a symbol? And if there is a real presence, is it through something like transubstantiation 
or is it through something like consubstantiation? The how is discussable, the who and the what is not. God established the sacrament. All Christians are obliged to celebrate it. How we understand it is something that we can discuss amongst ourselves. Doctrines of quarterly importance are things like, how do we organize the government of the church? Do we have one pontiff at the top, as they do in Egypt, amongst the Copts and amongst the Roman Catholics? Or do we have a council of patriarchs? Or do we have all independent congregations simply with a, a collective of elders? Another example of tertiary doctrine would be how many books are in the Bible? The what, i.e. the Holy Scriptures, is not in dispute. God has revealed Scriptures. The who, the Holy Spirit, is not disputable amongst us. But which book should be included in the Bible? It's a completely debatable point. Incidentally, for all you Muslims, every Christian agrees on 27 books in the New Testament. We have unanimous agreement about the books of the New Testament. You do not have unanimous agreement about your hadiths. Now, let us... I just want to explain why I've given you that prism, that paradigm. And it's because I am an ecumenical Christian. I don't care about your sectarianism and your denominationalism and your division of the body of Christ. Ecumenical Christians, like myself, are non-denominational. We try to build our lives upon the truth and we see the church as being the body of Christ that is laid across all the Christian denominations. And we seek within the full paradigm of the body of Christ, that which feeds our soul, that which draws us closer to Christ. And essential to this spirituality as an ecumenical Christian is personal responsibility. I have a responsibility to work out my salvation with fear and with trembling, with humility and with sincerity. It is about having convictions. I do have a conviction that in the sacrament, the real presence of Christ is there. But I don't have a conviction yet about whether that's transubstantiation or consubstantiation. But I wouldn't reject my brother who just sees it as a symbol. It's not that I think that he's right, it's just that I think unity is more important than telling him he's wrong. And I'll explain why I think unity is more important than telling your brothers and sisters that they're wrong. Especially publicly, as so many of you sectarianists are in the habit of doing. It's about weighing up the evidence of the different Christian groups and deciding which arguments you find more convincing and wedding these into your understanding of the faith. And you're open to doing that across the denominations. It's not about judging other Christians. That's for God to do. It's not for me to say to a Protestant, you're wrong, you're not a Christian. Christ knows who his followers are, not me. I don't sit in that judgment seat. That's for Christ to do. And I believe in treating people with grace, not with finger-wagging judgment, which means that I believe in taking a person from where they are and bringing them forward, not telling them in a finger-wagging way, why aren't you there already, you imbecile? <laughs> That's not Christian maturity. Christian maturity is about having patience and kindness and goodness and charity and grace for the other person. Christian, an ecumenical view of Christianity sees the truth as a fire in the middle of a field. The closer you are to the fire, the more illuminated by the fire you will be. The warmer you will be heated by the fire. The more clearly you will see your shadow, the sins of your life, because you are closer to the fire. 
If you're still in the same field where the fire is, but further back, you will be less illuminated, less warmed, and your shadow less clear. But you're still receiving some of the benefits. But if you're in a completely different field, where you can't even see the fire, you are neither illuminated by it, nor warmed by it, nor can you see the shadows of your life, that sin active in your life. And that is the way that I understand the difference between Christians and non-Christians. Christians are all in the fire where the field is, and to some degree, they're all benefiting from the fire. Some more than others, and the closest ones we call and proclaim as the saints because they stand out as examples to the rest. Those on other fields belong to other religions. An ecumenical Christian sees unity as one of the key values of the Christian faith, of the paradigm of the New Testament. And so it becomes important as a Christian that I do all that I can to support the unity of the faith. Which means that I will only fall out with a Christian if I think that they are making a mistake about primary doctrine, about who God is or what God has done. So if someone said God has not created everything that is, I would disagree with that because of what God has done. But I wouldn't fall out with a Christian because he believed in creationism because he's not denying the creator's, the creator as the creator. So I see unity of the faith as being essential and something that we need to maintain. So this statement is an appeal for unity amongst all Christians who are involved in evangelizing the city worth of people that have tuned into these debates on YouTube. Stop fighting amongst yourselves. Stop condemning one another. And if it helps you to navigate the differences, I offer you the schema that I use as a way for you to understand those differences. Now, what do we do then about actual errors? Real errors that people do make. Like, for instance, Let's say my position or my understanding about hell is an error. Well, let's, let's look at that. Are we all right for battery and stuff? Yeah. Okay. So I would say as another schema to help you navigate this is to understand errors in three categories. Errors of the first order, the second order, and the third order. Now this is being the third order being the most egregious. Actually, we'll just do it the, the, the errors of the first order being the most egregious. So errors of the first order, the most egregious kind of errors, are errors that have such gravitas. Yeah, yes, yes, sorry, yes. They, these are errors of, the, of, of such gravitas that they can lead someone to a life that is untouched by Christ. So if someone says that Jesus Christ was just a prophet and not God incarnate, or that he was just a good man, then such an error can lead someone to never discovering the truth of Christ's redemptive work. This is an egregious error. It prevents someone from ever encountering the real Christ. It would stop them from their discipleship and maybe even stop them from being discipled in many areas of their life, such as those that deny that abortion is murder. It clouds truth. Examples of this are things like the prosperity gospel, or those that try to dilute Christian teaching around sexuality, or those that try to say that Jesus is one way of salvation amongst many ways of salvation. Second order errors or errors that are substantial, but they're not so substantial that they would lead someone to deny a primary doctrine of the truth, even if they hold that primary doctrine of the truth, whilst also having serious errors in their understanding of the faith. 
such as universalism. The idea that Christ has saved everybody. Now, that isn't denying that Christ is the Saviour. It's saying that Christ is the Saviour. But it's saying that Christ has saved everybody. And that there is no one that isn't saved. Now, I would say that this is an error. It's a substantial error. But it isn't an error that causes someone to deny Christ as Saviour. It's an error that can lead to bad practice, i.e. someone who believes in universalism may never do evangelism because they never think it's worth doing evangelism and they might not see the importance of discipleship. There's many venial sins that would fall into this, into this kind of substantial error category. And the error that is just a basic error, the error that is third category of importance of views that are uh, to do with things like, well, how many books should be in the Bible? Well, clearly there's a right and a wrong answer to that question. Someone is right and someone is wrong. But anyone who comes to the Bible believing that there's 66 books or 72 books is still going to believe in the same God if they're reading that Bible with sincerity. It, it, there's clearly an error there. But it's not an error that's going to damage someone's faith in a great way. It will make them have errors in their walk for sure, but that is all. So there are three categories of error, and three categories of error are not all equal. Now I'm not saying that I've got a definitive understanding of, of how we can categorise error. I'm offering a schema. For all of you Christians who struggle to navigate the differences amongst Christians. So how do we understand heresy? What is heresy? A heresy is a known stubborn rejection of primary Christian doctrine. So Arius was a heretic because he denied that Christ was uncreated. He denied that Christ was eternal. He denied that Christ was divine and he was corrected and he was stubborn in his error and that's why he was an heretic. Joseph Smith was a heretic. Why was he a heretic? Because he denied the Trinity and he knew what the Trinity was and he denied it. He also denied that Christ was the creator, that God was the creator. He believed that um, material things are themselves eternal. What do you do with heretics? So, Sorry. so, just not talking to you, bro. What do you do with heretics? So, this is how we define heresy. I think it's a fair question now, to ask. What do you do no, with just, heretics? No, just, I'm not talking to you, bro. You I'm going to continue with, with my talk. Or do gonna you continue kill with them, my talk. put them in prison? So, are you going to define to people the third point, what you're going to do the third with a point. heretic? Unity in Christ no, about is the cure to are. all of Final the threats to Christian say. unity. To lift up, lift up the heretics. value of Christian unity. You owe your audience dust, an answer. Dust. I'm not interested what in talking to you. What are you going to do with heretics? Learn some manners. Wait until the end of the talk, and then I'll answer your question. What are you going to do with heretics? Learn some manners. Wait Very until the question. end of the talk. Learn some manners. You're not going to do talk Wait to until the end of the talk, and then I'll answer your question. Just answer it now, then no. I can walk away. No. So the okay. question you need to ask him is what he's going to do with heretics. At the end of this speech, talk, if he doesn't answer that, you should be really, really f disturbed. Because it is fundamental how he's going to deal with people he doesn't like, <coughs> or he believes that he's committed a crime. You know we're just going to edit you out, right? Goodbye, Dust. It's a pleasure to talking to you. This, remember where you are, by the way. This is Speaker's Corner, mate, where people are allowed to, to talk. So don't get too arrogant with your words with me, are you done? because that ain't going to help you very much. Okay. Remember, remember where you are. This is Speaker's Corner, not your bedroom. I'm walked into this kid's bedroom and gone, bu, 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 bu. No, in actual fact, I've interacted with you at Speaker's Corner, where you voluntarily freely came along. So just remember where you are. Thank you, Dust. Thank you, Dust. Okay, so, as, as I was saying, as I was saying, We'll talk about so you, you, you can just you can just edit the, everything right. that dust out because I'm just going to repeat myself. So the, 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 the actually leave that last bit with dust in. So because I want to make sure that nothing gets lost, JC. 
So, the unity of Christ is the very cure to the threats to Christian unity. Christ is the unifying factor. It is the person of Jesus Christ that unifies Christians. So let us build on Christ, who is the cornerstone of the faith. Let us build on him. Christians arguing with one another um, is, is, sorry, let me just catch my, uh, where am I? I've got put off slightly. So, Christians arguing with one another are not, helping the 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 scriptures talk about that we wash our dirty laundry away from public I'm not sure where that verse is i'll put it to you jc to put the reference in the comment in the uh, on screen but the scriptures teach us to deal with our dirty laundry away from public to deal with our differences away from public christians for the most part have managed in this corner not to fall out with one another in public. Sadly, I can't say that we haven't fallen out with one another, because we have. But we haven't been doing it in public. And those that would seek to argue in public about the differences between Christians, you have failed in your discipleship, because you are exactly doing the opposite of what the apostles tell you to do which is to keep your dirty laundry out of public view. There are different ways of serving Christ. Not everyone has to be the same. Not everyone does the same. We can all serve Christ in different ways. And it is about respecting one another and respecting one another's service. In terms of unorthodox teachings, well, love covers a multitude of sins and not every sin is the same and not every error is the same. So if you think that someone holds to something that is wrong, ask yourself, is this worth tearing up the unity of the faith about? I have been on camera tackling Catholic priests who teach that there are other ways to salvation. I've been on camera tackling fake Anglican bishops who teach that other religions are other ways that are acceptable to God because these deny who God is and what God has done. We have to understand Christians about the context of what we are doing on these YouTube channels and in this corner. We're doing evangelism to save the lost, not stroke your own ego. There are no Bobites or Benites in the work of Christ. And I just want to read to you um, uh, some scriptures to show what I'm talking about. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and 12, a verse that I use every time that I have to talk about divisions, and, every, and it's always worth taking it seriously because lots of Christians don't take it seriously in verses 10 and 12 we read now I appeal to you brothers and sisters by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you be in agreement and that there be no di divisions amongst you but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels amongst you my brothers and sisters what I mean to say is that each of you say, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Now, if there were divisions in the early church, we shouldn't be surprised that there will be quarrels in today's church. They had the apostles themselves walking amongst them and still managed to fall out. So why are we surprised if we fall out? But falling out, that unity that is being spoken about, is an exercise. We work towards it. We move towards it. It's not something that's a given. It's an exercise of spirituality. Theodorat of Cyrus said of these verses, In reality, the Corinthians called themselves 
after other teachers, but Paul uses his own name and that of the Apollos and Peter in order to make his point. By adding the name of Christ to the rest, he showed them how ridiculous the whole conflict was. So all of you Christians that are putting yourself into camps, Protestants against Catholics, Catholics against ecumenical Christians, you are ignoring the very instruction of the apostles. It is Christ that is our unity, Christ who is the cornerstone of the church, and it is Christ that we follow. Sticking yourself into camps like Bobites and Benites is a stupid way of thinking about what it means to be Christian. Perfect. We should put away such divisions. I want to point out that all that sectarianists do, all that people do who divide the church up into groups, the fruits of your work are these. You equip the enemies of the church with arguments against the Christian faith. You scandalize the lost that are inquiring into the Christian faith. You wound the discipleship of those of weak conscience and those who are struggling in the faith that when they see the prominent Christians arguing amongst themselves, it damages their own walk with Jesus. It harms the evangelism of the church because, for instance, right now, I'm having to do a very long response to sectarian Christians rather than evangelizing the Jewish guy behind the camera or the Muslim guy behind the camera or the atheist guy behind the camera because I'm having to waste my time responding to your rubbish rather than to the people that need to hear the gospel. Perfect. It harms evangelism. It creates a negative cycle of the same which eventually moves us all downwards. Because I guarantee that there'll be someone now who just wants to repeat the sectarianism and repeat the divisions and the arguments for division and thus creating all the same fruits again. It wastes energy, time and resources just like we're having to do now. Division means that rather than Christians working together to evangelize this park, we don't and we replicate and duplicate and don't communicate with one another. And it's the same amongst the YouTube evangelists and it's the same with the denominations who are sharing the same geographical space, wasting of energy, time and resources. Finally, not finally, penultimate point, it serves your own ego. All of you who want to put down your own brothers and sisters in Christ are doing so as a way of lifting yourself up. You push someone else down so you can be elevated. In other words, this is about your ego. It's not about serving God. And finally, as demonstrated by this talk, ultimately, this is all about disobeying Christ and disobeying the apostles. Christ himself prayed, let them be one, Father, as you are one. Let's just, I want to look at some other verses. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, let's just go there. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all bearing, we sorry, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. So the apostles are clear make every effort to maintain the unity of the church. Not every effort to divide the church, not every effort to put down the other Christian, but to treat one another with gentleness and patience, to correct one another in love, to speak to one another in private, 
not to use other Christians and their faults to lift yourself up. Note the emotional way that these scriptures are speaking. In 1 Peter chapter th in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 we read Finally all of you have unity of spirit sympathy love for one another a tender heart and a humble mind do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse but on the contrary repay with a blessing it is for this that you were called that you might inherit a blessing so Paul is instructing us that with one another we should have a spirit of sympathy, love and a tender heart. The problem with apologists is they're too cerebral and they forget that they are also disciples. And being an apologist is not an excuse for condemning, deriding or putting down your brother or creating divisions within the church. You have a responsibility as an apologist to uphold the unity of the faith. Note the emotional phrasing. In Romans 12 verses, could you grab that, sorry. Verses 12, 9 to 13. I hope you can see, guys, why I hold the position that I do. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. This is Christian spirituality. Where does sectarianism and partisanship flow with this kind of spirituality? How is it, to, um, how is it that we are showing honour to one another or being lacking in zeal or ardent in spirit? This is why as Christians we must stand up against evil. The evil of Islam, the evil of Nazism, the evil of nationalism the evil of liberalism. We must hate that which is evil. But the Church of Christ, the body of Christ, is Christ's presence on earth. How can you treat that as something evil? Every Christian has both the image of God and is a place where the Spirit of God resides. And you should honour it, not put it down, not mock it, not deride it not divide it. Now, I want to point out to you guys that St. Andreas said, every virtue is based upon love, compassion, mercy, humility, and so on. As we have been loved, so we must love one another. Loving one another brings people together. If you're doing something that divides the church, then you're failing in love. Perfect. Paul is talking about what we move in, in a response to the grace of God. That place that you move from, is it ego, is it pride, is it selfishness, or is it love, hope, faith, chastity, justice, prudence, goodness, kindness. Humility is the standout virtue of all of these verses that we've looked at. To be humble before one another. That's not common to the Greco-Roman world. The Greco-Roman world didn't value humility in the way that the Christians did. Living in a Christian virtue system will help with the unity of the church. So learn the virtue ethics. We are the body of Christ. Now note that the Trinity and the unity of the church are conferred in baptism. We receive of one baptism, by one spirit, to one Lord, for one God, one, one, one. 
and he begins a baptism. All those who are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and who are walking in the way of the Lord and trying their best to be his disciple are worthy of your honor and your respect. Saint John Chrysostom said, Meekness is the foundation of all virtue. If you are humble and aware of your limits and remember how you, your, you are saved, you take this recollection as the motive for every excellent moral behavior. Treating one another with love and respect as Christians begins with recognizing that you are a sinner saved by the grace of God. It doesn't begin with your intellectual prowess. Apologists, don't forget that you are also disciples as well. Any questions? Within the three part scheme of youth, yep. primary, secondary, tertiary. Yeah, it's not just threefold, it could be quarterly. Okay. Yeah, as many as we need. Okay. Where would you put doctrine and justification? Because it seems to me that that goes absolutely to the heart of salvation theology. Yes. It, your absolute conception of what God is and how we as human beings come to God. So the question is, just for the microphone, so the question is, where would, in terms of the schema about primary, secondary, tertiary, quarterly doctrine of importance, where do we put the doctrine of soteriology, i.e. the doctrine of salvation? And I would say that, that it, it kind of splurges across um, primary and secondary. The what of what God has done is primary. What did God do to save us? He became incarnate, he died on the cross, he rose on the third day. The what is non-negotiable, non-debatable, non-discussable. But how? So the how is, was it the act of the crucifixion? Was it the dissension into the, 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 the Hades? Or was it the rising on the third day? Or was it all three? Different Christians place different emphases in different ways. So, you know, depending on where you place that nuance, you can discuss, like, wh wh the how. Was, was salvation complete at the end of the crucifixion? Or was it only complete at the beginning of the resurrection? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can discuss the how, but what we can't discuss is the what. Any other questions on the topic? Then in that case, I wish you a good night. Things will go back to normal from next week when I'll be coming in, challenging Muslims, standing up for the faith and talking to people who are inquiring into the faith. Good night and God bless. Okay. Nice to meet you. Peace be bro. Next week we'll talk about Alphonsus Liguri and the definition of heresy. Yes, okay. yes, right. definitely. Okay. definitely. But definitely. I haven't got time tonight. No worries, so no worries. Take care, I, know, I know because yeah. mathematics played a part in your coming to the Christian yes. faith. Yeah. Are you happy? You've said on camera that you've become a Christian. Yes. So, so here's an example of someone who's become a Christian in the park. Wasn't a Christian, is a Christian. Agreed? Yeah, agreed. There you go. So um, you should also look into, out of interest, the Mendelbrot sequence oh, of numbers. Right, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. that'll be coming featuring in my arguments in the near okay. future. Oh, we're, we're all done. We're all done. Okay. Yeah. All right, God bless. You switched off the camera. Did you see that? No, see. It. See, it, see, it, see. It. Wrong, Hashim. It's right here, mate. It's right here, mate. Right here, Hashim. Right here, Hashim. No problem. Bob can help you. Bob, you're discussing a seat if you want. Brother, brother. It looks like Bob doesn't want to come in. No, I've got to go. I've got to go. We both have the same understanding of God. It's not just a singular thing. Yeah? Since, since Hashim invited me in, I'm just going to say, next week, if you want to come and talk about anything he said, feel free to come and talk to me. I can't stay tonight, otherwise I'd be talking with you. But You can talk to him, next but week. Bob won't talk to But next week, Hashim, I'll come and talk to you next week. There we go, it's agreed. Hashim wants to talk to me next week. We'll talk next week, Hashim. About a next week. Yeah, yeah, all right. Get in touch with him. And Tawid. Your concept, your concept of God. Yeah.